Recording in progress. It didn't. It didn't used to do that. A, a week ago, it didn't do that. Now it does that. I don't know why. Did anybody else record stuff regularly on Zoom? No. Anyway, hello, Nigel. I haven't said hello properly. Just, hello. Just took you for granted. Where are you sitting? Is that your own window? It looks very restaurant-like. Uh, it is my own window. Uh, it's that's a Georgian terrace opposite me. I live in a modern building above a restaurant. So you're nearly right. Yes, nice windows, very nice quality. Yes. Splendid. In Liverpool. Oh, Sonia, you're yes. in London, are you? In Canterbury. Okay. Cambridge. <gasps> oh, Third don't time, confuse time Canterbury. Time. So the reason I, I confused the two is that I had to write Canterbury down earlier because I was uh, researching uh, an artist that I thought one of my uh, guests was going to bring with them, and then they didn't bring the artist from Canterbury at all. So that was time well wasted. I haven't researched anything. Well, I don't know what either of you is bringing. And no. that's rather the point. <laughs> okay. Um, beginning at four minutes past seven, uh, shall we begin? Yeah. Sure. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This recording may involve some strong language and some adult themes, or it may not. We're really just about to find out in 30 minutes' time. You'll know as well as we do. Uh, hello and welcome to Comic Cuts, the panel show. My name's Kev F. Sutherland. You might know me as the writer and artist for Beano, Marvel Comics, Oink, Red Dwarf, Doctor Who, Viz, and my graphic novel adaptations of Shakespeare. But, but chances are you probably don't. My guests today, talking comics, are Sonia Long and Nigel Parkinson. Hello. Hello there. That's, uh, that's sound enough. And now, brace yourselves, because I'm going to do the theme tune. Comic Cuts. We're looking at a panel, and we comprise a panel. There's a few of us, so the panel sees a panel, then we talk about the comics from the panel we discuss, and we call it Comic Cuts. How did that sound to you? Very smooth. <laughs> I've been told it's obnoxious. I've been told that's the worst music mm. in God's Christendom, but I don't know if it is. That's another word for it. Sounds very excitable. Good. Well, that's what I like to start with. <laughs> it's it's very you, Kev. Can I just put it that way? It's very Yes, you. yes. I've also been described as Alan Partridge without the irony. <laughs> I have two guests with me today. <laughs> I have two guests with me today who've brought with them a panel from a comic or something close. We're going to see if we can identify it and talk about it. Maybe we and you will learn something about comics we didn't already know. Or maybe we'll just show off a bit and have an enjoyable chat. Let's see. Joining me from Cambridge is Sonia Long. Uh, Sonia, well, what should the listeners, innocent listeners at home, know about you? Right. Um, so I work primarily as a manga artist. I'm known as a manga artist. Um, however, you know, it's it doesn't mean that I can't draw in other styles as well. So although um, like I've worked um, producing sort of more manga style illustrations and pages, I do also delve into sort of like the more Western side of publications and such and such. Um, but I also illustrate across a whole bunch of things. Um, including things like some children's books um, and um, lots of like how to draw sort of stuff. I'm very well known for teaching because I'm not afraid to speak, unlike uh, some shy retiring artists out there. So I'm often um, at conventions, but also visiting lots of schools and stuff like that. I'm also really into fashion. What wow. differentiates manga from any other comics art? Hmm. It's a combination of kind of the uh, storytelling techniques, the way in which the panels are kind of formatted, what sort of stuff gets zoomed in on and what sort of like gets panned out. Some of the symbols and um, just um, little little visual sort of like cues given in manga are quite different to uh, comics from elsewhere. Um, and even there are subtle differences between Japanese comics and Chinese comics or Korean comics in terms of what things are emphasized and and sort of like the conventions in terms of sort of like um, what 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 certain symbols represents, but also style as well. Um, you can often I mean, it's like um, the, the style of character artwork. Some some are, some sort of like styles are more popular in Korea, for example, than you, you might see in Japan, even though they may look similar, you know, from from a distance. Um, also, the whole black and white feel of it with the dots, screen tone and everything, because manga is very much consumed as 
like masses and masses of volumes, you know, like 200 pages, you know, we're talking 20 volumes or something, you know, so um, it's very geared towards printing it cheaply, small, but many, many pages. And so that's why everything's all in black and white to sort of like make things affordable for people to sort of pick up and read. So there's lots of epics that go on. Uh, in is, manga. is there a black and white divide in between where you'd be able to say, no, that's not manga, that's comics, or you know, that's trying to be manga, but it's clearly not, it's uh, American. Is, is that an easy thing to say, or is it very blurred? Blurred, very blurred. Um, simply because a lot of people have this strange idea that all manga looks the same when it absolutely doesn't. Um, it varies so much from whether it's aimed at a young child through whether it's aimed at, you know, a young, uh, well, a teenager to whether it's aimed at an adult. Uh, there are times when, you know, you look at uh, something which is aimed at more sort of like mature audiences. You can't really, you can't really tell if it's manga or not. Um, you know, so my, my feeling is that so long as the creator is able to sort of like, or, or at least has a really good understanding of really what what techniques are used in manga and sort of like keeps it um, with uh, those, within the sort of parameters of the particular categories of manga, then it, it absolutely will look like manga. You know, it's, it's so, so yeah, I mean, the thing is it's like, if a Japanese artist draws like Spider-Man comics, is that manga? This is the yeah. question that I'm yeah. asking, because uh, so, the, these categories of which you speak are also a very interesting thing about which we must uh, find out a little more. But before that, I think we have to introduce a second guest who I notice is currently muted. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Joining us from Liverpool, Nigel Parkinson. Hello, Nigel. Evening. Or morning, depending when you're listening. Depending yeah. when you're listening. <laughs> Nigel, what should the casual listener at home know about you? Well, um, you know, I'm quite tall. <laughs> this is mainly <laughs> on my own air. No, uh, you mean like uh, career-wise? Like, uh, well, um, you know, I've drawn comics for 40 years, man and boy. And, uh, uh, you know, I draw the Beano now, but I've drawn loads of stuff. Well, I mean, literally, man, 1980, I'm given to believe, that's when you that's first right, yeah. broke the scene. Yeah, it was, um, I, had a, I had a job and I didn't like it. Uh, so I went, I took, I was offered um, redundancy. So I took it, I had 300 pounds and I went to Paris with the 300 pounds and enjoyed myself so much in Paris that I thought, I don't want to go back to having a job in an office. So um I decided to do what I'd always wanted to do anyway, which is to become a comic artist. So I did. Do you think it was any easier in 1980 to become <laughs> a professional comics artist than it is uh, 40 years later? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've been doing it since then, and it was hard enough for me. I think it's probably harder now because when I started, you remember, Kev, there was like Topper, Beza, Sparky, Dino, Dandy, Buster... Boopy, there were thousands of comics, and it's hard enough for me to get in when there were like 20 a week of these things, and now there's only really the Beano. And uh, you know, the, so the, shrink, the shrinkage of the scene in the last 40 years is, is quite a contrast, I think, to uh, the manga world, isn't it, Sonia? So, the manga world's booming, you know? uh, whereas DC Thompson's world um, is, is more turning into a museum in a shop that also has a comic attached. But a, but a fantastic comic it is, by the way. Uh, if, if anybody at home is not familiar with Nigel's work, uh, Dennis the Menace in the regular weekly oh, Beano, yeah. it would be your yeah. central focus. You were, for a long time, on Mini. You're not doing Mini at the moment. No, Laura Howells was Mini now. I, I, I was one of a uh, few people who did Mini. I did it for about four, four years and enjoyed it very much. But they, you know, the, the editor decides who does what, uh, not me. I'd have done the Bash Street Kids if it was up to me, but uh, it's not. So I have to do Dennis. <laughs> You've done a run on the Bastard Kids as well, haven't you? Oh, yes. Go on, Kev. Tell everyone. I've done everything. You have indeed done everything. I've probably got a long list here of everything you've done, but uh, but I think the sentence, too numerous to mention, will fairly yeah, well sum it that's up. Right. That's right. Well, we have two people who've brought images with them. They've brought a panel from a comic or something close, and I've said this paragraph. So, I think we should have a look at the first thing that the first person has brought with us. Uh, well, let's do this in the order in which we turned up for the Zoom call. Uh, Sonia was here first. So, Sonia, uh, there will be a sound effect going over this. OK. What have you got? Right. So, shall I share my screen now? Share your screen. And I shall explain. 
To the listeners at home, if you can't see the image, because this is an audio podcast, don't worry. The image is appearing on my website, comicfestival.co.uk. It's also on my Twitter, at KevFComicArtist. And it should be on the place that you get your podcasts from, depending where you get your podcasts from. But you know what? You shouldn't really need to see this image, because we're about to describe it in such amazing detail. Aren't we, Nigel? Oh, I see. This is where I come in. Oh, right. yes. Well, this seems to be, uh, I would suggest, you know, some kind of manga. <laughs> yeah. Just because it's black and white with the tones. And it's uh, it's got writing that seems to be not European writing. Mm -hmm. uh, starts off, they seem to be outside some kind of uh, market or restaurant or something. And there's a close-up of some very funky-looking people with ears, which I cannot begin to describe. Uh, Kev's better at describing ears than me. Well, and, I mean... Um, if, 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 you wanted, if you wanted help in describing this, for yeah. the reader at home who's an aficionado of panelology, uh, what comics look like and how they're drawn, uh, for all the world, if it weren't for the shape of the voice bubbles and the language in the voice bubbles, you might mistake this for French ligne claire uh, mm. drawing, the style that you would see in Tintin, for example, and many yeah. uh, recent French and European productions. Of course, it's in black and white, and it's using the grey tones, which we once called Ben Day Dots. We did, uh, yes. <laughs> um, I saw a podcast, I saw a podcast, I saw a YouTube thing recently explaining the difference between Ben Day, Lettertone, and the various things yeah. that have changed over the years. Uh, this will have, I imagine, been done in Photoshop. Um, as for Nigel or I guessing what it is and where it's from, I honestly wouldn't know where to start. I do a lot of classes going into schools, working with kids, and it's teenagers who are au fait with manga. I find they're au fait with the same very popular titles, so they'll know uh, Attack on Titan, they'll know Naruto, they'll know uh, Black Butler, uh, they'll know, and not necessarily the flavour of the month though, they'll sen seem to know things that have been around for the last three or four years, but this, looking at the ageing of the page, has it been around longer? Uh, Nigel, you have a guess at what this is. Maybe make up oh. a title. Let's see how offensive we can be by accident. To, to me, I, I, I don't know, but it seems to have some sort of meaning beyond just people hanging about. There seems to be in some way some personification of something. Uh, further than that, I cannot go at the moment. Oh yeah, dude with the long ears looks like Buddha. Uh, it's got a spot in the middle of the head. It's got the uh, the hairstyle with the with yeah. the top knot and the very long ears which you see on Buddha. Uh, but he's a Buddha on a diet, so maybe it's a young Siddhartha. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess that this book is called The Adventures of the Young Siddhartha Going Out for Noodles. Am I yeah. wrong, Sonia? <laughs> yeah, you're not completely far off. You've definitely <laughs> caught one of the characters. And I'm really glad to, say, to, to hear you say this actually does not look dissimilar to sort of like French bon dessiné mm -hmm. and like, you know, some of the illustrations there, because absolutely, this is exactly what I was talking about. You know, this is not the sort of like manga that's normally aimed at teenagers and is super popular. This is drawn in a different style. Um, so this was from quite a few years ago. Um, and you've almost got it. Can you guess who Buddha's friend is? Oh, right. Oh. Buddha, Buddha's friend has got long hair. Oh, Nigel, you get to guess first. Oh, well, is it um, <clears throat> No, dear. <laughs> uh, I, no, I won't, I won't guess. Because... Well, I'm going to go there. I think it's Jesus. Oh, okay, it's Jesus. <laughs> he's, he's got hieroglyphics yeah. on his shirt, he's got, but he's, he's got, got long hippie shirt. hair. He's got a moustache yeah. and a beard and a T-shirt. And he's also wearing a crown of thorns. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm not seeing the image big enough to see his crown of thorns. <laughs> All right, hold on a second. Let's see whether I can zoom in a little bit. There I, I just, I just had to lean closer to the screen and I could see the crown of thorns. There you have it. Okay, okay. So I've zoomed in a little bit more over there. <laughs> I can see, I can see now the hieroglyphics on his shirt, which is fish times two, loaf of bread times five. Excellent visual gag. Jesus. <laughs> Okay. But yeah, so, I mean, I, I specifically chose it to be in Japanese yeah. so that it would completely flummox you. So you have yeah, no yeah. clues whatsoever aside yeah. from like the images. Um, yeah. So uh, what, what else would you like me to confirm for you or at least help you in terms of translating this? So well, what, what's the book or series called that we're looking at? Sonia? Okay. So in uh, original Japanese, it's called Sento Onisan, which means like 
it's um, Saint Big Brother. Um, right. Now, so saints, um, and uh, the the English language translation of this, which was actually uh, that there is an English language version of it, but I actually bought this originally from Japan in like you know a floppy magazine and everything back in the day when it was actually coming out for the first time. It's called Saint Young Men, and right. uh, the comic, the premise is Jesus and Buddha are having a holiday on earth um yeah. so they're just they just come down to earth and they're just like trying stuff out seeing how things are like <laughs> hanging about this particular episode is it's i mean it's set in japan so essentially they're flatmates they're like room buddies so they share this like little apartment in in like tokyo whilst you know they're on earth um and they hear oh you know there's this like festival just around the corner let's go let's go nice. um what you can just about see um, in the corner of this image here is like the, the page before like Jesus actually tries to get dressed up and everything for it and he's like oh yeah I'll put on a kimono and everything I'll put in like a sword and, and Buddha's like you're cosplaying that's not a proper outfit <laughs> and so um, obviously as well you read from right to left uh, because yeah. this is the original Japanese so um, over over in this sort of like top panel over here uh, Jesus is saying, well, shit, here we go. I have to wear a T-shirt after all. Um, so they're at a Matsuri, a, a Japanese festival. And you can see, yeah, these are all the like food stands and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then B Buddha's sort of like, you know, oh, for goodness sake, Jesus, you know, you always put too much like emphasis on your appearance. <laughs> and then over here, it's like, even if you're wearing a T-shirt, you can still enjoy yourself, you know, you can still have fun. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. And it's like, although... It's really cool. There's so many different food stalls going on over here. And then down here, he sees a cotton candy stall for the very first time. And he's saying, it's like, wow, this It's like, oh, this is amazing. It's like, kumobitai. it looks just like clouds. You know, hey, hey, mister, hey, mister, is this food? Is this actually food? And, and the guys are saying, oh, it's really sweet. And he's like, give me one. And then um, over here, uh, but it's sort of like, you know, wow, it really does look like clouds. You know, it's like, I would never have known uh, this, 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 like this, this, this is just such amazing looking food. It's like, remember, it's really sweet. And then, and then like Jesus is saying, give me another one. And like, Buddha's like, hold on, hey, hey, you've got your own. All right, you know, like finish, finish off your own. And he's going, it's like, wow, it's, it looks like such a dream, you know, and it's, it's, isn't it nice, Jesus? I remember when you used to like, you know, look down from heaven and, and, and you'd say such things. But then you know he gets sort of like cut off before he goes onto the next page. So nice. so there you go. That's that's my page. I purposely actually mosaiked out the uh, the title that was in English at the top there. Oh, yes, uh, I can just see to that. make sure yeah. that you. So could... Saint Young Men. Who is Saint yeah. Young Men by? Um, it's by. Uh, hold on a second. He I'm comes... delighted to find that you also <laughs> have to look up Japanese titles. This yeah. is this is a big problem with me. With any creator that I'm not familiar with, which is of course anybody who's created comics in the last twenty years, or any comics that have come into my purview in that same period of time, it's in one ear and out the other. And that's even if they've got an automatically familiar name to me. Uh, manga creators, I have the greatest difficulty with. Yeah, well, there's there's a lot of them out there. And remember, I, I bought this comic in 2008, okay? So I do have to sort of like flick through. It's uh, Hikaru Nakamura. And is that a creator who's um, done uh, a lot of work, a lot of other work, or who's best known for this one title, which runs for a long time? I, I would say that that, that uh, this, this creator is most well known for this title. I don't know really much about the creator aside from the name. Okay, right. okay. It's, I, I don't know whether male or female or whatever, but I do know that it was serialized in uh, Morning Magazine. So can, can you see the camera at this point? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, so here you go. This is my original... This was this oh, was the original mag. You know, you know how in in, in Japan, you, when when you buy like comics, you don't actually buy the the, the beautiful volumes of, of graphic novels. You buy them as a cheap magazine mm -hmm. made with just like cheap newsprint. So it, it's like a it's like two three pounds or something. This is like a serialized magazine. You buy one every couple of weeks or like once a month, and it's got a whole bunch of different stories in there that you just enjoy. And then when you finally find a series you actually like, then you you wait until the collected editions come out nicely and everything. So yeah, that's that's the reason why I was like, oh yeah, which way which one? That's what I've been amazed when I picked up uh, Shonen Jump. I've got a, a copy of, yeah. and it's like a telephone directory for for yeah. thickness. It's a yeah, very it's very thick thing, yeah. and that but that's the weekly or, or bi-weekly edition of the thing, the A4 yeah. telephone directory, and costing 
uh, such a small amount. The yeah. similar thing happens yeah. when um, you're comparing the French weeklies um, mm -hmm. alongside the Beano. They cost the same. They will be two pound fifty to three pounds. Except the French weekly will be about three, maybe four times the size of the Beano, simply because they sell so many, and that can happen. And the Japanese sell so many more yet. Oh. I mean, mm -hmm. th these sell in in the hundreds of thousands, don't they? Saint Young Men will be one of those half oh, million absolutely. sellers. Yes, absolutely. And um, this particular magazine is aimed at um, more like old, older sort of like guys, mm -hmm. I'd say. So um, it, we're, we're talking, you know, um, mature teenagers and, and, and young men, probably. This, this, this is, that's the demographic for this particular magazine. I'm just going to point out something. Mm. Um, where the, can you see the screen at this yes. point? I can. Here? Yeah. Look at yeah. that. Does that actually look very manga to you? Not at all. It's 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 got an uh, indie sort of alternative kind of feel, hasn't it? It's got yeah. even yeah. it's almost got like um uh, like a Scott Pilgrim kind of feel to it, hasn't it? I would I would I would say that's because the uh, indie look has taken so much yeah. from there. This is yeah. what we've seen in the last twenty five years: is American and British uh, indie and also mainstream uh, artwork, but taking an awful lot from manga. I've always been aware of how John Romita Jr., who was drawing Spider Man and Daredevil when I was reading them twenty five years ago, and looked looked much more like his predecessors, including his father. And then you see something like Kick-Ass, mm -hmm. which he does with Mark Miller. And the faces have become uh, little faces with big eyes, especially for the kid characters. And he's using a lot more manga shapes. He's using a lot more manga proportions uh, for uh, his boxes and his style of storytelling. The influences have gone both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed looking at that, at least. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely. Well, <laughs> Nigel, I think oh, uh, the bar been... the bar has okay. been raised. The standard has been set. Right. We, yeah, we've yeah. seen what what amounted, I think, to uh, Bill and Ted's big adventure with gods in <laughs> Japan. Yeah. Nigel, what have you brought to compete? Well, I've brought something very different. Uh, guessing because Sonia was on that it would be black and white and manga. I've done I've got this many in colour. Uh, which could only have been produced, I think, in one country in the world at one time. And it's, if I can choose the right picture, because I've got two versions of it. Oh, what's it matter? Here we go. Oh. Now wow. then, what do we make of that, everyone? <laughs> I'm at an unfair advantage because I immediately recognise this because I have this piece of work. Sonia! Uh, uh, oh, uh, sorry, listener at home or wherever you be, you'll be able to find this image on uh, the website comicfestival.co.uk or on my Twitter at Kevf Comic Artist, or you should find it at the source of the podcast, depending where you get your podcasts from. But don't worry, you don't need to see the picture because we're about to describe it, <laughs> aren't we, Sonia? Yes, we are. Okay, could you scroll up a little bit, please, Nigel? Um, so I don't have this comic. Um, I, as I said before, you know, I'm much more of a manga specialist. Um, so, you know, um, it's, I, I, my, I haven't got the, the hugest sort of like English language comic collection. Um, so it's, it's in color, but lots and lots of warm color. Most of the detail is done in terms of the intricate line work with lots of hatching, lots of emas, like, like I can see, it, it looks almost like pointillism in that bottom right corner, yeah, just the fine sort of like detail in yeah. that. Um, so the colors are mostly kind of like, um, they look kind of like flat fills or washers on top of very, very nice detailed line work. Um, if, I, if I can step back and describe uh, broadly to the person who can't see the picture, we're looking at an entire comic page with, I, I think, nine or ten panels on. We can't see the entire page. Yeah, this I, I need to see the whole page. Um, <laughs> we're looking at an entire comic oh, cool, page, uh, which has got some square, some rectangular, and a couple of round panels in. Mm -hmm. We're looking at figures who are in a desert landscape, uh, possibly an African landscape, which you can identify <laughs> because there is one white character in uh, car keys and desert wear and the other characters are African one in a tribal garb uh, and one in a sort of uh, post-war military uniform and with a fez so we are in some sort of colonial world depicted in a one two three four five six seven eight panel page uh, very dynamically laid out, line drawn and in colour. Sonia, you were telling us about the, the, the detail and colours. 
yeah so there was there was essentially um like for example the rendering in the clouds it looks like it's done either with markers or possibly with watercolor i'm not quite sure because it's got that sort of like soft kind of like feel to get the the, the, the clouds that are rendering um so i i mean the, the colors are beautiful lots and lots of sort of like you know um amethysts and orange and yellows um i mean i can read text you know so so there's all all the text here it, it says to me obviously you know um uh there, there's maasai maasai warriors here so yeah. this is definitely you know um and uh it it's um they're, they're trying to track something they're, they're tracking something um that they're, they're looking to find are they, are they finding a person or an animal or something they're looking uh, uh, a safari has gone missing a safari has gone missing and they're trying to find this this group or this uh, this party that's gone missing. I, I can read you the dialogue from uh, one of the pictures, a third of the way down the page. How far ahead is the m missing safari owner? There are no signs of <laughs> Obwana Fraser. I say the safari did not go this way. I'm guessing that se second character probably didn't have an accent like I just did. And the caption mm. tells us, but Fraser overrules his Maasai tracker and they make for the pools. Mm. Sonia, uh, I don't know if you saw the title, which Nigel has actually <laughs> shown us, yeah. but, then, but then suddenly hidden. Very uh, quickly gone down. <laughs> so Sonia, do you want to have a guess at what this is and where it's from? Oh, something like um, uh, Trouble in the Savannah or something. Um, it's to, to me that that's um, that, I, it, that that that's kind of the very brief impression of of that title that I got just earlier before he's stubbornly now not letting me see it. Um, ah, let me see. I mean, it's in English. I don't know whether it was translated from something else or whether whether it was written in English straight away. Um, I I can't assume that. Um, because let me see. I mean, the thing is, like, the text is fitting the, the bubbles quite well. So, you know, it looks like as if, you know, it's written, you know, like it, it's well done for it. So it's probably not German, just because German is 10% longer than English to fit inside speech bubbles. I know this because of what my publishers have told me when they've translated my works. So, <laughs> so, so um, yeah, um, let me see. Based on the kind of style, maybe around 1950s or so, 19, yeah, 1950s ish, something like that. Sonia uh, is getting a nod to the 1950s oh, from okay. Nigel. Right. Good, good, good. Yes. I mean, because, you know, again, like, you know, my, my Western comic knowledge isn't great. Yes. Um, it could have been in sort of like, you know, a. a like a boy's adventure annual, or maybe featured in something like that. You know, the only mm. the only things I'm thinking about, um, oh, I, I, I suspect that my husband's got a couple of things, you know, aim, aimed at, at sort of like young young boy, adventure stories and, and action stories to, to, for boys to read, you know, back from like the, the, the 50s and 60s. It looks mm. like it could be something like that. Um, but uh, that's- well, have, a, have, a stab, have a stab in the dark at the name of a comic that might spring to mind. <laughs> oh. no? I mean, I already said, like, surprise in the Savannah, trouble in the Savannah. That, okay. that's, that's my idea of the well, title. Okay. I'm, I, I, I'm going to have my guess. because oh, I'm Biggles I'm... or something is the only other thing I know of oh, at yes. that time. Oh, no, that's but, certainly but... the right subject matter. The thing, okay. the thing about the comics of these era, and we're right with the 1950s, aren't we, Nigel? It's something like well, 1959, this, is it? Well, this particular one is from 1960, so oh. yes, it is the 50s. <laughs> and it's a strip called Fraser of Africa, is that right? That's right. Fraser of Africa. It's uh, drawn by Frank Bellamy, uh, and that's the characteristic style of the art. And it appeared in the weekly comic, The Eagle. Am I right? Ah, OK. Yes, that's right. And yeah. the interesting thing about it, why I chose this, and I could have chosen about 100 uh, pages by Frank Bellamy, because they're all so beautifully laid out, is that he... He, he had a real passion for Africa. He went holidaying there every year. This particular story is about a group of poachers who had infiltrated a safari and had gone off uh, illegally poaching, uh, you know, killing animals for, for money and all that. And Fraser, who wasn't, had nothing to do with safaris, was asked by the locals to track them down because they were Westerners. And... Uh, because Frank Bellamy was so enthused by, by Africa, he, he, he'd gone out there and he painted and all the skies and the trees and the animals are actually what he saw when he was out there. Painted he, from life. Painted from life. And he went to the 
uh, the printers of Eagle in, in Liverpool, which is another reason why I chose it, uh, and asked them how he could get the colours to look exactly as he wanted them, uh, uh, according to the way they printed them. Now, they printed using RGB, not CYMK, because it was, it was an optical printer. So he, he had to paint it in a completely different way to how he, he saw it, uh, so that it would work out. And he, he went, he tried many times uh, to get the colours right. And this was what he wanted. He wanted this sort of uh, tan look to it, that everything was just um, to give the impression of the heat and the expanse of Africa and just the feeling of being there. And as Sonia pointed out, this last picture here in particular, with the uh, the lighting effect and the shadows and the, the pointillism that's going on there. It's very much a Frank Bellamy trademark. Uh, Kev, you recognise that, don't you? Well, yes, a lot of um, readers who won't have seen the Eagle comics necessarily from the 1950s will know Frank Bellamy's work from Thunderbirds, the comic strip he did through the 1960s in TV21 weekly comic. And in the 1970s, many people will be familiar with the illustrations he did for Radio Times, especially of Doctor Who, uh, the John Pertwee and Tom Baker Doctor Who images would have cover images by Frank Bellamy, and it was his stippling style. He also did a strip in the Daily Mirror called Garth. And this stripling style, and his incredible figures, so mm. active. Uh, Fraser of Africa's not got so many of them. There's one figure, a third of the way down yeah. in the round bubble, who's got yeah. the, the hands. He's yes. very expressive with his hands, uh, like yes. a Renaissance painter, getting these yes. poses where there'll be an extra angle. The person and his body are leant over in a, in a quite unnatural way, as if if it was a, a Rubens or a, 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 or a Caravaggio, uh, people are, are posed and counterposed. John Buscema, for the Marvel artist, does yeah. very similar things with his poses. I think Frank Bellamy used a lot of photo reference as well, didn't he? He did, and there were his own photos that he took while he was out there. Uh, Fraser Buffett looks very much like Frank Bellamy. Uh, we, we often draw ourselves when we're doing comic strips, not because we're looking at photos of ourselves, because we know what we look like. And uh, he was drawing himself. That's uh, that picture with, where he's uh, pounding his fist. That is very much Frank, what Frank Bernie looked like. It's uh, very I, interesting to hear the guy who draws Dennis the Menace saying, <laughs> yeah, I'm just drawing me, really. I've got a circle for a nose. My eyes physically yeah. overlap. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. If only but this least, was a visual podcast. <laughs> But, you know, at least my hair is tamer than the Dennis's. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like, to be fair, you know, whenever I draw my manga characters, they're always known for being ridiculously beautiful with long flowing hair and everything, you know. Well, there so, we are. There we go. It's true. We do draw ourselves. <laughs> the colour process that they had to use to print this, that's, was that photographia? Is that, is that yes, what it was? Yes, that's right. And it was, it was a, a machine that was actually built in 1951 in... Uh, or was it 1950, uh, at Eric, uh, Eric Benrose in Liverpool, the printers, specifically to print the, the Eagle. And they kind of cobbled it together to, and they eventually bought uh, machines to their specifications. But it had been uh, designed to print the Eagle in, in realistic colours, because they were very interested in having, you know, realistic, they had the life, the life of Christ and the story of Marco Polo, as well as Dan Durr and, and other things. They wanted it, to be a cut above the usual comics, which were usually like three colours or maybe four, if you were lucky. Uh, yeah. You know, it, so it's very unusual. Uh, and rather advanced. It's still, it's still very beautiful to look at. Oh, the Particularly eagle was, was a high was a high watermark in uh, the quality of art artists that were used. The fact that credits were put on many That's of true, the yeah. writers and artists, which subsequently didn't it hadn't happened before, and it didn't happen afterwards. Once the eagle uh, its company was bought by another company, they went straight back to the anonymity of artists. Yes. They went straight back to the cheaper and inevitably more profitable uh, publishing methods. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be until really a, only a little bit in the 1970s, which was printed on Litho, which would come close to this quality. Yeah, I mean, I was very much most struck by just how the, the, the just the variation and shading of those clouds. It really looks like, you know, dusk, you know, like a proper yeah, sort of like evening, 
evening sort of sky. It's it's beautiful. Um, so so I mean that's why I was sort of like oh you know it's like it feels like it's fifties, but it's like oh but the coloring is it's it seems really quite advanced for what it what it was. Um, but yeah, it's like, as soon as you said the eagle, I was I was like wanted to smack myself because it was like yeah the eagle is one of the comics I have heard of, but I was just like mind blank, you know. <laughs> well, it's interesting when we're looking at the history of comics that we do become quite uh, myopic and 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 centralized mm. on on our own history. I find this uh, when I'm listening to podcasts about comics and they're all about American comics. The Americans oh, yeah. uh, speak the same language as us, but not about the stuff that um, someone uh, brought up on British comics would be uh, wanting to perhaps hear, hear more yes. about. And the Eagle, uh, the, another strange thing about the Eagle is that they're sometimes collected up, uh, sometimes not, um, but they've, they've drifted off into history. They haven't become celebrated. They haven't become made into movies and TV series, most no, of these things. No, that's true. And Fraser Radical would make a brilliant TV series because the, you've got Africa, all you've got to do is get some actors, and there you go, you could film it. Uh, Dan Dare, different story, you couldn't really do that, but uh, yeah, it, there's lots of great characters now. Dan, Dan Dare is, is the one that it, that is remembered, and has, it has, yeah. of course, been made into TV series. Uh, but then the respect uh, in which writers and artists are held, that's another big deal. I do remember the anecdote, and Nigel, you may have heard this as well, when Kevin O'Neill, comic artist, started working for IPC, the publishers, in the 1970s. Uh, they would put gash board on the table, a hard piece of cardboard that you would use as a cutting surface for your scalpel. And he turned over the unused piece of gash board that was there when he arrived, and it was a page of Frank Bellamy's, this artist's, oh. Heros the Spartan artwork oh, from the 1960s. Yeah. The artists didn't get the artwork returned to them, and it was nope. used as gash board, and when yeah. Kevin was there, there was also a flood which destroyed much yeah. of the artwork that they had. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yes, I, I, I'm assuming that in Japan it's a very different, in the manga tradition, Japan, Korea and other countries, a very different kettle of fish as far as uh, the respect shown to people and their artwork. Ooh, actually, it's a little bit difficult because um, manga artists are well known for being horrendously overworked in Japan. You see, the thing is, the way how manga is produced um, is it's very, very fast, you know, like, you know, get it in, get it out, sort of like thing. It's it's very, very sort of commercial industry. Um, so, um, you know, it's, I don't know um, whether, uh, you, you heard recently about um, Miura, who, re, who who died who uh, re, uh, recently. He was only, I think, in his 50s. He was the creator of Berserk, which is a really, really well-known fantasy uh, manga. Um, Hyper-realistic detail, um, very, very intricate sort of like scenes. Um, he worked very hard on it, um, and he couldn't, he hasn't quite, well, he didn't actually fully completely finish it. But, you know, there were games made, there were films made, everything, you know. So this is like... Um, yeah, essentially, Berserk is sort of like you know, think think about the popularity of Naruto. Now make it like th uh, like twice as older in terms of in terms of like audience and sort of like um, just just violence. Um, so so it's it was it's an incredibly beautiful piece. Um, but he uh, he died. I think it, it was it was something to do with his heart. Um, and prior to him dying. Um, you could see some of the notes he made. It's like, oh, you know, first time I've had a holiday. I've had I took two days off for the first time in like five months. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I was actually able to go to sleep early today. Or, you know, oh, I'm in hospital again. I have to, I have to remember to not, like, work myself too hard. So, uh, annoyingly, um, no, it's it, ma manga and also animation uh, artists yes. um, are pushed extremely hard. Extremely hard. Um, so, some are... Even the super successful ones, they 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 tend to sort of want to overwork themselves a little bit, um, and also the way how it's done in it. Well, manga is created; it's very different to a lot of like Western comics sort of like creation. In that, you know, the artist might have an assistant or two, but they take care of the entire thing. Sometimes, you know, they write the whole story, they pencil it, they ink it, they tone it, they letter it. You know, it's not passed from one person to another at different stages. Are there um, not artists working no. in a studio for for yes. a head of studio? Sometimes. Uh, sometimes there's like three or four working together, but they have to be able to do every single part of that process. 
They're right. not they're not just taking one bit or one bit or one bit. The, the, the only time when it's passed from from one to another is maybe the lead artist focuses on the face and getting these sort of things mm. done while someone else maybe works a little bit on the backgrounds. But then, you know, it still has to all go back to the lead artist to sign off on or add finishing touches and everything. You know, so it's not someone else entirely doing the pencils. It's not someone else entirely doing the inks. They actually share it between them. And so that's how manga is produced. Now, is, animation is, it, is different. Oh, yes. Uh, the, the manga, is it rewarded? I mean, for all this work they're doing, are they then making the fortune? Mm. No. <laughs> okay. I, would, I, th I, I think say, that silence speaks volumes. Yeah, it, it's, um, I mean, this is also part of the reason why um, it, it sometimes can be a little bit difficult to get um, uh, manga artists to actually fly over from Japan to very many uh, co conventions or events um, in the West is because they're often so tied by their schedules, particularly if they're mm. working on a very popular series, they, yeah. they, they just can't leave. They, they, they can't they can't stop, um, you know, um, and and um, unfortunately, uh, a, a lot of series sometimes die a very long protracted death simply because um, it's the commercial aspect of it is pushed so much. It's sort of like, you know, we need to extend this series. You need to write a whole second series, you, need to, you know, you know. Yeah. so it's 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 a tricky industry to sort of survive in. Um, it's it, it takes it takes many, many years to even get your name recognized as the lead artist on the on that cover of the book. Um, and uh, even then, you know, it's it's you, you, um, many many still work themselves into the ground. Nigel, how does this compare with the workload of a Beano artist? Uh, it's it sounds very similar really, <laughs> because uh, uh, it's it's constant. You know, I often work seven days a week. It's not uh, something that is uh, like a, an easy job, a nine to five job. Uh, at least for me, you know. I mean, some people might find it easy, uh, and I've. Worked for 40 years, put myself in this enviable position of having no, no holidays and, and working <laughs> hard. And of course, in a normal year, I would not at the weekend, I'd be going to uh, Comic Cons anyway, working yes. there. So, you know, it's not. Don't, it's, it's don't not I remember being life. told that Leo Baxendale ran a studio of sorts, uh, that they went to pick up artwork from him and they wondered how he could produce so many pages. And it turned out he was, he was running a sort of uh, conveyor yeah. belt system with a few people it, inking other bits for him. He did, Leo Baxendale, of course, the uh, visual creator of the Bash Street Kids and many of the Minx and many others. Uh, he, uh, not in those days, but in the 60s and in the early 70s, he did have, a, he had a couple of assistants and I think his, his wife helped him ink some things as well. Uh, so it was a kind of studio system. But the, the most famous studio system in Britain, of course, was um, Frank Hampson's uh, in Southport in near Liverpool. Uh, where he had, uh, he would often just, he would lay out the entire two pages in colour and it would look perfectly fine, like you could print it. But then he handed out different panels to a team of artists who would spend five or six days on one drawing, getting it right, putting the pelican inks on and then uh, doing the cross hatching and black over it again and again. So it was perfect. I mean, look, to me, looking at his original rough, as you call it, and the finished pages, I can't really see any difference, but you know. It would seem that Eagle Comic was the home of unnecessary yeah. overwork in yes. the name of art. I mean, yeah, it was really it was. all about raising the quality of something that you weren't going to get any paid, paid any more for raising the quality thereof. Well, it's true. And of course, in, Frank Hampson was paid a lot of money to do this. Uh, and uh, the Eagle sold a million copies a week. So they could afford to do it. It's a different story now when something that sells 40,000 is considered a roaring success. You know? And yet the amount of effort that goes into the full colour pages of uh, things like the, the American superhero comics and uh, 2000 AD, uh, when we grew up with them being printed with really poor colour <laughs> or entirely in black and white, yes. uh, it is, is, a, is a tale for another day because look at the clock. Oh, we have actually, know. I'm afraid, run out of time. Uh, Sonia, where will we find you on the socials? Um, well, first off, just go to my website, firedrake.net, because from there, you'll see a link to all of the stuff like my Instagram, my Twitter, my Tumblr, my Facebook, my official Facebook, and and all of that sort of stuff, you know, so that's probably the best place to go to, to get the links out to everyone. And Nigel, where will we find you? Uh, well, I've got a blog. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, it's called Nigel Parkinson <laughs> Cartoons. That's what it's called. If you Google that, it'll come up with my blog, and uh, I'll, I'll update it one day, so, you know, don't worry. 
I tell you what, kids, just buy the Beano every week. And then every if week. you have any requests, send in a stamped addressed envelope to yeah, DC okay. Thompson, Dundee. <laughs> and just I'm say so just say the Beano artist. We'll know who you mean. Uh, thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you so much, Nigel, for uh, sure. joining me. That was Comic Cuts. Uh, I was joined today by Sonia Long and Nigel Parkinson. We were looking at Saint Young Men, the manga title, and Fraser of Africa by Frank Bellamy from Eagle in the 1950s. If you've enjoyed enjoyed this or have any questions you can find us on our various social media i'm on twitter at kev f comic artist and at kev kev f comic artist.com please click subscribe to be sure of hearing every episode when it comes out thanks again to sonia and to nigel and to you for listening i've been kev f and this has been comic cuts the panel show hooray and we're out <laughs> thank you well done, kev. yeah well done I, you know, uh, I've done three of these today and not once have we needed the picture that I brought along as a fallback <laughs> yeah, option. Yeah. Uh, and we're not, you're not going to see it today. I'm going to save it for another few. I'm, course, I'm probably, yeah. hopefully, never, ever going to need to bring one well, myself. Although we draw for a living, we, we like to talk, don't we, Sam? Clearly. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like a coiled spring, isn't it? You oh, keep us stuck so inside, away from light and humans for long enough. Yeah, you don't speak to anyone all day and then you've got to do something, haven't you? Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you so okay. much, Nigel. Uh, I'll let you press the leave buttons. I won't sh okay. shout, shoo you out the door. Thank you yeah. so much. Oh, I'll message you the I'll message you the comic pages. And oh, please well send me your pictures. The, the, Sorry, and, thank and you. And the name of the artist and everything yes. as well. So yes, please. Thank down. you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, Sonia. Bye, Carl. Cheers, Nigel. <laughs>